You know, when I submit this talk to RealsConf, it is in the track of we are living in a distributed world. But I, I'm surprised to find that I'm the only talk uh, in that track. Seems like there are no other tracks there that, that talks about scaling of Rails applications and distributed systems. So I, I think the reason might be that as Rails developers, we are following some best practices so that making our app distributed or, or scale our apps doesn't seem that hard, doesn't seem that problematic. But this one, this, this GitLab thing is a bad boy, I would say. <laughs> it really got some problems and, uh, oh, hi. I'm mainly gonna talk about how, how we fix those problems. So thank you very much um, for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Minky Pan. I came from China. Uh, I work for Alibaba Group. And that is my GitHub account and my Twitter handle. <laughs> You're welcome to follow me. Um, so what is GitLab? Well, GitLab is, well, let me say it secretly, it is just a GitHub clone, open source clone of GitHub, but, but nobody likes to say that. <laughs> so uh, a better way to say it, it is a Git box that you could deploy on your machine. It is installed uh, on premises. Mm, so just a quick survey, how, how many of you use GitLab in your organization? Oh, two of you, thanks. Mm. So GitLab is, if you see it as a black box, it actually exposes two ports. One is HTTP, the other is SSH. And HTTP are used on two purposes. You can clone a repository via HTTP and you can push content to a repository via HTTP. And also more importantly, as a Rails application, it provides rich user interactions with the web page. And on the other hand, the SSH only allows you to clone to Git operations. And, and in the back end, from a very simplistic point of view, it stores its content on Git. And that is what makes this thing a monster to scale. <laughs> very problematic on that part. So if you look closer, it also uses some other stores on the back end. Uh, one is MySQL. Actually, they also support Postgres secure because they use Active Record, which abstracts the actual uh, implement implementation of the DB, so it's changeable. And the other is Redis. Use it as a queue for uh, delayed tasks and also as a cache. And the other is file system. They, they use file system to store the Git repositories. So that's the black box. If we uh, open it up to see what's inside, then you could see it's basically structured like this. Uh, it's all open source, so you could also download the source code and see it. And when you deploy it on the front end, mm, there are two parts, engines and open SSH server. Uh, well, the, the reason why those components are in, inside GitLab is because GitLab has a omnibus uh, package that you could install, and they actually depend on those and two other packages. Uh, Nginx is for HTTP and open SSH server, as we mentioned, is for the SSH port that opens. And when some requests came, uh, for HTTP requests that came to the second layer, uh, Unicorn um, is for the ordinary Rails requests. Uh, but for the requests for Git, like clone and push, it goes to GitLab workhorse. It's uh, another, Mm, service written in Go to make it fast. Uh, and if it came as a SSH request, it goes to the third part of the second level, uh, namely GitLab shell. Um, and on the third level, the third level is called by the second level components. Mm, uh, mainly Rails was responsible for operations on page. And GitLab Git is a wrapper around Rugged, and Rugged is a wrapper around libgit 2 on the fourth floor. And Sidekick, uh, yeah, that, that was some, for some task handling. And on the lowest level, it is Git and libgit 2 They utilize both implementations of Git. You know, libgit 2 
uh, if you don't know about it, is actually a rewrite of Git um, in a way that is portable, embeddable, works as a library. Ergo, the name Git2, they see it as the second generation of Git, but with a lib as a prefix because it's a library. Um, so this structure works really great for small teams, but the company that I work for has 30,000 employees. Well, this is from the physical year report of last year. They just published a new one this year, days ago, the day before yesterday. And the stock price went up. <laughs> it looks good. It's a public company. Um, so let's scale it. So how we do this? Well, we first consider about the problem on the front end. When the request came, it's either HTTP or SSH. As Rails developers, we are most familiar with HTTP. And on the server, it's, you, it's actually run as unicorn instances. And that's something we are very familiar with as well. Mm. We just put the engines in front of them, set the upstream in the configuration, let them point to the unicorn servers in the back, and we're done. But for SSH, how to you know, deal with this is a problem. <laughs> um, so I started a project called SSH2 HTTP. It's open source on my GitHub account. It basically eliminates all those SSH requests because and the way Git interacts with the server um, between HTTP and SSH is very similar, and the request to SSH could be easily delegated to a Git request on HTTP. And as we could see from the slides later, SSH is actually such a pain in the ass. Um, there are more complications to this. So I guess that is the reason why GitHub nowadays set HTTP as a default. You know, when you go to a public repo on GitHub and the clone URL, uh, as far as I remember, is defaultly as an HTTP uh, URL instead of a SSH one. There, there are actually complications to the architecture that makes the SSH access a little bit uh, slower than the HTTP one. But actually, um, in Alibaba, we did not use my approach. Uh, my, my approach was this slide, but actually we used this slide. Uh, what we did was we are not using engines as the front end. We use something called LVS, and it is a feature from the Linux kernel. And the specific part of it that we're using is called IPVS, uh, which expands to IP virtual server and LVS stands for Linux Virtual Server. It is actually a layer four switching service, unlike Nginx, which operates on layer seven of the TCP IP stack. Um, it does uh, load balancing on the transport layer, so it supports all communications as long as they are TCP IP. So the difference between HTTP and SSH are illuminated. But there comes as a, that comes at a cost as well, because when you go down to the fourth layer, you lose the ability to do health checking with the status code returned by the request. Because on the seventh layer, you could see actually what the status code of your HTTP requests are and, make, and mark some server as health or, or not healthy. But on fourth layer, you cannot see those. You can only see packets. You can only see the date. Uh, and URL rewriting, you, you lose that ability as well because that's on layer seven as well. Mm. And like I said, that comes with complications because uh, SSH protocol involves some security mechanisms that checks with your keys. And if you have more than one machines in the back end, their keys are not the same by default. So when you deploy the application, you, for, you first have to copy the host keys across the whole cluster to make the host key the same. Otherwise, when you connect to uh, more than one servers, 
uh, the client will complain, saying that, oh, the SSH key is different. Is this, uh, uh, th this is a security vulnerability, you, you gotta check it out, and it w will not connect. And secondly, if you remember, you could add SSH, key, SSH SH keys from the client via the web pages uh, when you clone a repository, like on GitHub. And same thing happens in GitLab. So when you add your SSH key to the server, it has to uh, dispatch or copy all of that keys across the entire cluster to make every machine accept your key. Uh, uh, specifically, they add a, a line in the .ssh directory slash authorized keys. And they have to do it on every machine. And, and we, we did that with, uh, well, you cannot do that with Sidekick because Sidekick only, you know, only one, one machine of the cluster fetches that job and the other will ignore the job. So you have to, uh, do it in a way that broadcasts all the keys across the whole cluster. And we, 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 we did that with Redis PubSub data structures. Uh, and that goes uh, the back end. Uh, well, the real trouble begins uh, at the part that GitLab stores its repository on the FS. And I wanna you know, pause a moment to you know, remind you of the 12-factor app. You know, the reason why GitLab is such a bad boy, unlike other Rails applications, is because it violates the fourth rule of the 12-factor app. But that is some principle. Uh, advocated by Heroku, where the first, fourth rule says uh, backend services uh, should be treated as attached resources, uh, like Twitter service, Amazon service, MySQL service, they should all be configured as a UIR that could be easily attached and de detached. But GitLab stores some content on file system, that is the you know, source of all evils. <laughs> the, the content they store are firstly, Git repository, and secondly, user-generated attachments and uh, avatars. Well, we are going to move them to the cloud to make it scale. Uh, well, actually, standing at this point, you have a lot of choices. Um, the choice that I'm going to elaborate might not be the best. I want to you know, uh, analyze the options that we have. Mm, so if you, when they run into a real application that has a similar problem, you could, uh, you know, evaluate those operations as uh, options as well. So the first option is mm, some feature provided by GitLab Enterprise Edition is called GitLab Geo. And that doesn't really solve the problem. You, you see how, they, how GitLab Geo does things is they make full replications of your GitLab instance across servers. Uh, it assumes that each machine of your cluster has enough file system storage to hold the, all the content of your Git repositories and they make 100% copies across them. Uh, it's officially supported, but it really didn't solve our problem at Alibaba because um, the the size, the overall size of all repositories are big. We want we don't want to store them on one single machine. Uh, it, it, there's there are not enough disk space to hold them. Um, so from a distributed po system point of view, GitLab Geo. Um, it's a one master n slave full replication design. And in CAP theorem, which says consistency, availability, and partition tolerant cannot be achieved at, at the same time. You can only achieve two of them. So GitLab Geo achieves A and P of those three parts. And there are no disaster recovery supported and absolutely no sharding because it's full replicated. And the other option that we could use it's seemingly a very perfect way to solve the problem. 
Well, first of all, we eliminated SSH by um, that gem written by me called SSH2 HTTP, and so that we could you know, forget about the problem of SSH and focus solely on HTTP. And seemingly, uh, there is something we could take use of. It is the, you know, every repository stored on GitLab could be, uh, could be routed using namespace slash repo name. And that part uh, appears in almost every URL of every request. Like when you see the repository commit history on page, the road, uh, you, the, the road format contains that part. And when you clone it, when you push it, they all contain that part. So why not use that part as a routing key and make some routing logic into Nginx to make a sharded GitLab. Mm. And every, every, by doing that, every request after coming to Nginx will be sharded. Uh, for example, if we are going to have a cluster of size three, uh, we could invent some hash algorithm that distributes, uh, that hash the namespace slash repo name into the cluster into into any one of those three machines. Mm, so, it seemingly it's it's perfect. So, but can can you you know spot some problems inside this? Actually, one problem is Sidekick does not have sharding. Oh, maybe it does, but <laughs> you have to dig into it and see how you could do that. You know, um, each. Each shard of those three GitLab shards could spawn some sidekick tasks, which needs to be consumed by corresponding sidekick shard as well. So when you start the sidekick shards, you have to start it with special queue names as well. That's one complication, and there are others. Uh, changes have to be made on application level as well, because it's not every mm, page on GitLab falls into a single shard. Like in the, admin, in the admin page, you could see a list of all the repos with their sizes. Well, if that request falls down into only one single shard, you, you will not get that information because some repos reside in some other shards. So major changes will be introduced to the application level as well. And also, you need super user authentication because the SSH requests are not designed to uh, access all repos. There are user authentication layers in front of them. It's also another application layer, logic layer change that you have to be introduced. So this is actually not ideal. Every, um, every way of solving this comes with a cost. So let's then think about how to deal with the file system storage? Well, we got a lot of options. Well, first, mm, we could make it a 12-factor app by, you, by making the file system attachable. There are some vendors who provide such solutions, like hardware network attachable storage. They usually call it NAS, and there are software NAS as well, like Google has GFS. Uh, and also, we could use remote procedure calls to only make shards on the FS level instead of on the application level of the entire GitLab. And also, we might consider killing it. We could maybe use Amazon S3 to replace the FS as the backend for Git stores. Well, we evaluated all those options. It turned out that NAS is not for Alibaba. Um, hard NAS, well, Alibaba do not buy those things because it has non-IOE policies. Uh, and soft mass, Alibaba does not have that yet. Like Google have GFS, but Alibaba does not have AFS. Uh, but I have to remind you that those two options might be good options for your organization if you want to scale GitLab. You know, they are really good means to solve the problem because it introduces very little change to your application level because all the change are confined on the lower service that got attached to GitLab. Um, but I did not try them, and they, they surely come with a cost as well, because soft NAS, software NAS tends to be very complicated. 
Uh, as far as I know, there are some good solutions called CFFS, which just came to stable about a month ago or days ago. And if something happens on that layer, you, you need to have some very ta talented you know, operation or DevOps engineers to solve those problems. And also by attaching a NAS, soft NAS, you also have, you, you will also lose performance because each operation to each IO to the FS is now networked and they're added latency to each network IO and, and you are replacing the, the thing on a very lower level so the added cost will be much. So that those two operations, if you have a chance, could you know dig into it. And, and RPC, well, that is a good solution. I, you know, looked up how GitHub solved their problem. Seems like they're doing RPCs. They're dispatching access to Git uh, to to some RPC calls into Git shards instead of Git lab shards. Well, it's a shard on a different level. They does that. It surely looks like a good solution. Um, and what we did at Alibaba is use the fourth option. We killed the FS and use the cloud. What clouds we use? Well, it's called Alibaba OSS. Uh, well, it's a, something that not that well known, but you could thought of it as uh, the same thing as Amazon S3. It's object storage in the cloud. And how we did that? Well, the rest of this talk will become a little bit uh, technical. Um, it turned out that GitLab has three ways to access Git repositories, namely libgit2, Git, and Grit. Grit is a very old jam. It uh, is written in Ruby. Uh, well, we found that it is a uh, it could be eliminated, making the whole problem easier, uh, because it's only used in the wiki part of GitLab, and it's used in a jam called Gollum. And Gollum was designed to have its uh, Git access part pluggable. So we unplug Grit and we plug Rugged, which uses libg2. Okay, so that makes this only Git, Git and libg2. And we compare those two projects, Git and libg2. Well, Git was pretty old. It's probably written by, uh, started by Linus Torvalds, and it did not consider the, the problem of backend to plug and unplug. So its backend is hard to re replace. All of the code are written to access content from the file system. But libgit2 is very modern. Uh, I, I don't know how their creators think about the problem, but they, they designed the backend as replaceable. You could write your own backends. Mm. So the basic idea is we, we write our own backends. We write the backends that actually stores the content on uh, the cloud storage. And also, well, the grid has been eliminated. Also, we have to implement Git on top of libgit2 because Git cannot easily replace its um, backend storage, but libgit2 could. So cloud backend, cloud-based backend, what, what's that backend looks like? Well, mm, that involves some details about Git. Git has two parts to store its content. One is called ODB and the other is called RefDB. Uh, ODB is for the chunks of data that you put inside the repositories. Uh, and the RefDB is the branches, tags, uh, that you put in the repositories. Uh, and for the ODB, there are also two parts, mm, two, two, part, two kinds of ODBs. Uh, the first is loose ODBs. Those are, you, you know, Git is fundamentally a, a content addressable um, file system. The content addressable being the SH1, S, SHA1 value of the object that you are trying to fetch. So loose storage actually stores each SH1, SHA1 values uh, on, on the, I, I will, you know, opened up a uh, example. Well, maybe I will talk to you. Huh, that's a Git repository. And if you go into the .git directory and you see tree, uh, you could see there are some, like those, those files, those are called load stored files. And they are also pack stored files. 
and those are the pack store files. And that, that's what I mean. So we um, wrote a cloud-based backend to store both, of, both types of those files. Uh, the basic idea is uh, for the loose files, it's pretty straightforward. When you read, you make a HTTP request to read it from the cloud. Oh, I forgot to explain the RefDB. It's very similar to loose files, where you can see it's under the refs directory. Uh, all of your branches are inside the refs has master, and master will tell you a SHA one value. So it's basically key value store. Uh, and that translates to HTTP requests pretty straightforwardly. Uh, you see each RefDB re read, we, we made it a HTTP read, and each RefDB write, we made it a HTTP write. Each loose ODB store, we make it a HTTP port, and each loose OSS store, we made it a loose HTTP read. Mm, so that's the simple part. The, the, the complicated part is the packed uh, content of it. Because if you only store those loose content, it will be as slow as SVN. The, the, reason, the very reason why Git is so fast is because it has a very good design of packs. Pack files are used both as a way to transfer content from between server and the client and as a way to store the content to your repository on disk. It's, it's both a transfer file format and a storage file format. Uh, the way we write OSS, uh, the way we write those packs are easy. We just translate them to port request to HTTP, but the way we read it is complicated. You see, every pack came with the index file, and that index file tells you about if you are looking for some object in the pack, where to start. So. Each request uh, will be translated into a lot of uh, ranged HTTP requests. First, it will read the IDX file to find the next range to read in the pack. Uh, and then it read only that small portion of that file using the range header from the object store. So as an example, if, the, if, if Git need to read this content, then First byte will be blah, 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 and it will binary search in the index file, and it will get a offset to begin in the pack file. And in the pack file, it will see if this content stored is a delta or not. If it were a delta, then it has to continue looking for the base of that delta. And the whole chain continues, continues, until you find the root. And by combining all the mm, uh, uh, combining all the deltas with the base, you get the object that you're re reading. And here's an example. It's a real-world example. The chain is as long as five. You have to jump inside the pack file to actually get the thing that you want to read. Because each time you read it, it's actually only a delta. So that is a real problem to us. Because if the I/O if the I/O pattern inside this pack file is not good enough, then you will end up having a lot of range requests on the HTTP. That will make the thing awfully slow. But the good news is um, the inventors of Git, they made uh, some very good heuristic algorithms to uh, when the pack files are generated so that those IO patterns are not that bad. So when we make a range request, we could actually make, make the range bigger than we needed. Therefore, we could fetch bigger content from each range request, and that content would be sufficient to fetch all the way to the root of that object. And by this good characteristics, we reduce many HTTP requests to make this you know, whole solution not that slow. That's one part of it. And the other part of it, as I said, you have to uh, make Git talk to libg2 because you Git does not have the backend replaceable. It turned out that it, this is pretty easy. Actually, the inventors of Git, they're pretty smart folks. They write Git in a very Unix way. All of the commands are, they call each other. Like in Git fetch and Git clone, 
in, on the server side, uh, they first got called was git upload pack, and git upload pack will then call another command called git pack objects. And uh, for the commands that deal with uh, the transmission protocols, we will not touch it, and it's complicated, we, we, and we do not touch it. We only touch the thing that does I.O. from the disk. So we only need to replace the git pack objects. And in the git push scenario, we only need to replace or re-implement git unpack objects. And implemented on top of libgit2 is very easy. It's no big task. And also, there are other scenarios. There, where there are two scenarios when git doing git push. Their small data got unpacked uh, right away and got written to the loose storage, and their big data didn't get unpacked because unpacked consumes time, and they directly create an index for it and write those pack. So in this case, we need to re-implement git index pack, which is pretty easy task turned out to be. All right, so after all of those changes, let's see the, how, how the performance looks like. It's it definitely gonna be slow because you're still changing a fast file system I.O. to some slow uh, HTTP I.O. So let's see how it looks like. Well, the text fixture we use is a repository called GitLab CE. It has more than 200,000 uh, objects, and when packed, it weighs more than 100 megabytes. And git push, well, about the same performance because, uh, you know, on file system, we write it directly to FS, but on cloud, we, we write it, them directly to, to HTTP, and there, there are not too many new operations created. It's just only added a small amount of time to each of um, those two operations. Uh, and git push delta uh, also, well, like, like I said, there are two scenarios. When you push large content, it only stores the pack. So this is a large content scenario, and if you only push a little content, it got unpacked and stored loosely. Uh, and this is the delta case, well, also not too much time added. And git clone, well, it is actually 100% uh, slower, because when you do clone, uh, the, the range operations happen, and that's, that's what makes it slow. And also git fetch, it got way more slower, because this is the delta fetch. Uh, this usually happens when you do git, pu git pull, uh, when, when your coworkers updated the repo. And it also has to go through the whole process of the range operations that I mentioned. So it's really slower. But the good news is it's not that slow. Uh, the user has to wait longer, but mm, it's not as a, something that they cannot wait. Uh, and also on the page, it got way slower. All of the Rails operations, uh, all of the Rails operations were affected because we are operating on a deeper level, and Rails will call rugged, rugged call libgit2. Libgit2 is slow, so Rails is slow. Like on this page, we're listing a file list, and the show actions now take five, sec five seconds to run. Uh, well, let me see, all of those benchmarks are all without cache. So the real world scenario will be better because we have cache. And uh, like this, this is a, mm, another real operation. And uh, before the change is 50 milliseconds and after is five, about five seconds. So that's the reason why we have to add much cache to it. Um, we added cache on multiple layers. Uh, like those real layers, we added them I'm not gonna you know, elaborate on all the cache that we add, but for some interesting aspect of this, mm, th this is something interesting. Well, you know, libgit2 uh, was designed in a way that it could have more than one ODB backends, and it, you could even set a priority to it. So we basically made a hamburger structure of that backend. We added two new backends to it, which is the cache backend, 
you know, the servers that we deploy those things to still got a file, sy file system to use, and we use that as a on-disk cache. If we read some content once, we will store it on the file system so that the next request hit, it could just read the content from the file system instead of uh, the remote, um, instead of making remote HTTP calls. And the good news is the ODB of Git never change. You can only put data into it, but you can never modify data. So we are free from the problem of uh, cache expir expiring. And also the RefDB uh, could cache that via Redis, but that's way more complicated. That, that might not worth the effort. I might remove it in the future because you have to expire the cache. RefDBs got updated all the time. When you commit a new commit to master, say, the ref slash head slash master got updated and you have to expire the cache. So, uh, not gonna go into details of when the cache got updated. Uh, and lastly, I wanna, uh, you know, say something about future work. Uh, for, for right now, it seems like this um, idea works uh, more or less acceptable. And uh, if you guys love it, I will try to do a AWS S3 version of it because um, it's currently working on OSS, which is not so widely used. And uh, you know, there is uh, uh, some need for this. Uh, you know, the, the reason why there may be some need for this is because GitLab is, cannot be deployed to Heroku at this moment. And if we could make this um, backend for AWS S3, then the users of GitLab could have a chance to deploy it to Heroku. And also, mm, GitLab still has many direct calls to Git, uh, like, like for the history page of, the, the, the commit history page of a repository, it actually spawns another Git instance to fetch the result. So we could eliminate some direct calls to Git. And after, uh, if, if, we ha if we develop that backend for AWS S3, we could add settings for the user to choose which backend he wants to use. It could be either file system or AWS S3. That would be perfect. And Gollum, Gollum we, should, we could do some work to make them use Rugged as the default. In libg2 itself, we found it less performant uh, we found it let, you know, slower in many scenarios per compared to Git, so we could improve its performance in the future. And I will be actively do those jobs on my GitHub account, so uh, if you're interested, you could uh, you know, look, look into my account and see how it goes. Thank you very much. Thank you.